Hello everyone and welcome to today's live broadcast, Scaling End-to-End -end NGS Solutions for Clinical Diagnostics in the Cloud. The team from Biopath's Genetics Laboratory will be the speakers for this event. Biopath is based at Guy's Hospital London, which leads the South London NHS Genomic Medicine Center. We are excited to bring you this educational webinar presented by LabRoots the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. This webinar is sponsored by Kyogen, a leading global provider of sample to insert solutions, and DNA Nexus, the leader in cloud-based genome informatics and data management. The GXP compliant in the Nexus platform provides seamless and secure integration from the sequencer to Kyogen bioinformatics tools, where disease-focused researchers have a complete solution to move rapidly from raw data to valuable insights. I'm Alessandro Riccombeni, science lead at the Nexus EMEA, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located in the lower left of the presentation window and type your question into the box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have for time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice that you will be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the screen icon located on the lower right. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window, or use the Q&A button to let us know that you're having a problem. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located in the bottom left-hand corner of your web page and follow the process of obtaining your credits. Now I'd like to introduce you to today's speakers, the team from Biopath Genetics Laboratories, who will share insight into how they implemented their automated, scalable, and cost-efficient clinical bioinformatics pipelines in the cloud. Including The team includes uh, Iju Vuk An, Genome Informatics Lead, Andrew Bond, Clinical Bioinformatician, and Matthias Janssen, Clinical Scientist. Please join me in welcoming the first speaker, Iju Vuk. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Thanks, Alessandro. Hi, so um, as Alessandro just said, I'm Vuk. Um, I'm the Genome Informatics Lead at Biopath uh, Genetics Laboratories. And I just wanted to uh, start things off here uh, by giving you a little bit of context about us. Um, so we are the Genetics Laboratories at Viapath, which is based at Guy's Hospital, uh, which is itself part of Guy's and St. Thomas's NHS Foundation Trust. Um, Viapath has spun out of the NHS some years ago and has, is now one of the largest pathology providers in the UK. Uh, we have over 60 laboratories spread across four sites, uh, mostly in and around London. Um, the genetics labs uh, works quite closely with the clinical genetics uh, unit at Guy's Hospital, and we serve a population of around 6 million, million people in the southeast of England. Um, we are the, the main lab. Uh, for the South London Genomic Medicine Centre, as mentioned earlier, um, uh, which means we've ta been taking um, a key role in the 100,000 Genomes projects, which has um, been happening in the UK over the last few years. Um, and just sort of looking ahead slightly, we are expecting to increase uh, our activity as the genetic services in the UK move to uh, a new model of working, uh, a new genomic medicine service. Um, and as part of that, we are again going to be a, a key um, laboratory in that new setup. And uh, as a result, we will be seeing quite a lot of growth in our work. Um, I also wanted to just talk about some of the uh, benefits that adopting the cloud genomics platforms has given us. Um, as I said, we are growing at the moment, and we are also sort of 
uh, collaborating and working closer with other laboratories in our region. And the cloud genomics platform has really helped us standardize the bioinformatics methods that we use across the various labs. Uh, by having everything in the cloud, it makes it very easy for all the various laboratories to access and use the bioinformatics tools that um, we jointly make available. Um, uh, cloud is well known to uh, allow scalability, and I just wanted to point out that it, this it allows you to scale it both up and down. Um, this elastic provision can be very useful uh, as your bioinformatics costs um, directly reflect the activity you have and you're not paying for capacity that you're not using. Um, the, uh, um, these platforms have also helped us to bring on new methods, uh, new algorithms, new, uh, new um, bits of software, etc. in a very quick way. A lot of the infrastructure is there for you, and we can you take advantage of that uh, to let us concentrate on um, our sort of area of expertise, which is the bioinformatics and a lot of the sort of informatics and infrastructure is taken care of you, which allows us to bring these new things on very quickly. Um, we found that DNA Nexus and Kaijin um, offer us a, a long-term solution. We're comfortable and confident that they are not going to disappear next year. And all that has helped us to um, end up with an accredited uh, service to ISO 15189 standards. Um, we're very happy that DNA Nexus and Kaijin are global players um, and taking part in various global initiatives and also um, are able to provide us uh, the expertise that they have gained from operating those various different regions. Um, and finally, the, all this sort of infrastructure that, that um, the cloud genomics platforms give us will allow us to very seamlessly expand into other domains as they come uh, into sort of uh, our scope. Uh, for example, clinical trials. We we're recently looking at some clinical trial work, and and having the these pl platforms in the cloud has allowed us to uh, tick all the boxes that the clinical trials people need, um, at least for the bioinformatics. Okay, so I just wanted to end by acknowledging some people quickly. Um, the genome informatics team who provide all the bioinformatics for the genetics labs. Um, the exome team as well, the group of clinical scientists who are interpreting all the output from those bioinformatics pipelines. We work very closely with the clinical genetics team at Geisens and Thomas's. Um, obviously, uh, although we are doing the diagnostic work, the, the clinical side is hugely important. Uh, and especially when it comes to things like multidisciplinary uh, working, which we need to do to make the most of the, um, the new genomic technologies that we are able to um, to use for our to bring care to our patients. Um, it's very important that we work closely to the, with them, and that's been going very well. And finally, I just wanted to mention the guys in some Thomas's charity, who very kindly were able to um, fund some of the early work to kickstart um, the XM service. Great. So I'm, I'm now going to hand over to Andy, who's going to talk a bit more about the bioinformatics. Thanks, Rook. Okay, hi. So uh, I'm Andy. I'm one of the clinical bioinformaticians here at Biopath, uh, working in the genome informatics team. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit about how we're using DNA Nexus, um, some of the features of DNA Nexus, and sort of how it suits our needs as a growing clinical laboratory. Um, so to start off, I just kind of want to give a, an overview of how we get our data from our sequences um, into ingenuity variant analysis, which is where our clinical scientists will uh, do their variant interpretation. Um, so we have a couple of MySeqs and an XSeq in the lab, and they, they all are, are configured to output their data to a local workstation um, over the network. Um, and that local workstation is just a, um, a high-spec PC with um, Linux installed. Um, and once the data is there, uh, we need to demultiplex it. Um, 
And to do this, we use ECL to FastQ from Illumina. Um, we were keen to automate this process uh, just to speed things up and um, make our lives easier. Um, so we have a script on the workstation that runs every hour and it checks for any new run folders that have come off the sequences and haven't uh, been demultiplexed and it will initiate demultiplexing on that data. Um, and then we have the next step is after demultiplexing is that we need to upload the FASTQ files um, into DNA Nexus uh, so that we can begin to process the data. Um, so to do this again, we wanted this to be a fully automated process. Um, so we have another script on the workstation that again runs hourly and this script will look for any runs that have been demultiplexed and need uploading into DNA Nexus. Um, and if it finds one, it will create a DNA Nexus project. And the way it does this is um, it uses uh, some software called the DX Toolkit. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a following slide. Um, and then once it's created the project, it then uses a piece of software called the Upload Agent, which is provided by DNA Nexus. And this is a command line client which is used to upload files into a DNA Nexus project. And it has a number of great features, um, such as integrity checking, which is important for us because we're handling patient data. We want to make sure that um, that data doesn't get corrupted in any way when it's uploaded. Um, it also has features such as it will resume if the, if the upload is interrupted for any reason um, due to like a network error. Um, so that's important when you're uploading a large quantity of data um, and also it can form parallel uploads, uh, which speeds things up a lot. Um, okay, so, oh, so another thing I was going to mention is that at some point we'd like to look at um, streaming our data directly from the sequences into DNA Nexus. Um, so cutting out the local workstation entirely. Um, that's certainly something we'd like to look at in the future. Um, so, once our FASTQ files are in DNA Nexus, um, the script that's running on our workstation uh, will then use the, a panel code that is in the FASTQ file names to determine which one of our different pipelines that FASTQ needs to be run through in DNA Nexus. Um, and so, uh, so if we we essentially have a config file, um, uh, and in that config file, every panel code is linked to one of our three workflows. We've got a whole exome sequencing workflow, um, another workflow for our for our other sort of smaller targeted panels, and an oncology workflow. Um, and that config file links each panel code to workflow, so that our script knows which workflow um, should be used. Then the script will set off the pipeline for each FASTQ using a uh, using the DX toolkit, which I mentioned previously. Um, so the DX toolkit is a SDK software development kit that is provided by DNA Nexus, and it essentially allows command line access to um, pretty much all of DNA Nexus's features. Um, so that's great because it means we can automate everything. So you can launch jobs, monitor jobs, uh, build apps, uh, SSH into jobs, um, download files, all sorts of things using DX Toolkit. Um, so that's what we use to set off the pipelines. And then once the pipelines are set off, uh, we then begin uploading the remaining files from the run folder um, into DNA Nexus. Uh, we don't do that initially, just to speed things up because we want to start processing the data as quickly as possible. So we just get the fast queues up and get the pipelines running, and then we upload the rest of the data afterwards. Um, so uh, the next step then, uh, I'll go into a lot more detail about our actual pipelines and 
what they look like um, later in this talk. But uh, at the end of each pipeline, um, the DCF file will get submitted into Ingenuity Variant Analysis. Um, and that's using a, an app that is provided by DNA Nexus. Um, and that means that our entire process from sequencer to uh, the variants being ready for analysis is seamlessly automated. Um, doesn't require any hands-on time at all, which is great. So just to mention a bit more about those pipelines. Um, so we have a whole exome sequencing pipeline. Um, and this uses Dragon to get from FASTQ to BCF in 10 minutes. And we process about 30 samples per month through this pipeline. And then we have another pipeline that uses, for our sort of a smaller targeted panel, which uses BWA and GATK3. Um, and, we're, and we're processing uh, sort of well over 100 samples every month through this pipeline. And then we have another uh, pipeline for our EGFR uh, oncology panel, um, which uses um, Varscan and Vardic to do variant calling. And um, the sort of the thing that makes this pipeline stand out from the other two is how urgent the samples are that go through this. Um, the cancer samples where the results from these tests can, um, can determine what treatments patients might receive, et cetera. So we need a really rapid turnaround time on these. Um, so we've got a pipeline that only takes 30 minutes. Um, and generally these runs are set off uh, late in the afternoon and the next morning the variants are in ingenuity ready for analysis. Um, so it's a very quick turnaround. Um, okay, so obviously as well, we are a diagnostic laboratory. Um, we handle patient data and therefore we have quite strict rules that we have to follow in terms of uh, data security. Um, so we needed to get DNA Nexus uh, assessed and audited by Biopath and Guy's and St. Thomas's Trust, um, their IT security teams and information governance teams um, to, to uh, demonstrate that DNA Nexus was safe for us to upload patient data to. Um, so we don't upload any patient identifiable information in our file names or anything, we, we, it's all pseudonymized. Um, and DNA Nexus has uh, a huge number of inbuilt security features, um, which you can see some of them summarized on this slide. And they comply with all sorts of um, information governance uh, regulations and um, legislation. Uh, and that was satisfied our IT security teams that there was no problem with us uh, uploading our data into DNA Nexus. Um, and this slide just shows a few more of those features. So things like, you know, the data is encrypted end to end. Um, so it's, you know, it's all very secure, which is great. Um, and sort of related to that, we have, um, as a medical laboratory, we have to demonstrate that we meet uh, ISO 15189 standards, which are the quality and competence standards for medical laboratories. Um, so every year, uh, our lab is uh, inspected by UCAS, who are the UK accreditation service, and they look at all of our services and make sure we're meeting ISO 15189 standards. And um, as part of this, our pipelines have been assessed and, a, and have been shown to meet ISO 15189 standards and they form an integral part of our accredited services. Um, so now I want to talk a little bit more about what a DNA Nexus pipeline actually looks like, what it's, how, you, how you would build one, um, how easy it is to use, and some of the features. Um, so the Kind of, kind of core components of all DNA access pipelines are apps. Um, and apps are essentially standalone tools on the DNA access platform that have defined inputs and outputs. Um, so you might have a, an app for BWA, an app for GATK, um, an app for each tool that you would use as part of your pipeline. 
Um, these apps can be run from the command line um, using DX Toolkit, or they can be run through the web interface. Um, and each time you run an app, um, it will spin up a new virtual Linux server, which will be uh, sp uh, have the system requirements specifically for that app. Um, and the app will run in that, that Linux worker and just um, yeah, each time that app is launched. Um, and then this slide here just kind of shows some of the configuration options that you get with some of these apps. This is BWA. There's a huge number of settings you can change, and you can even, if, if that's not enough, you can add additional command line options there as well. And you get a nice README as well there, which explains how to use the tool. Um, so there's lots of apps that are provided sort of off the shelf by DNA Nexus or other third party developers, um, which you can just install and use in your pipelines immediately. Um, and some, a lot of these are open source as well, which means you can actually kind of download the app, modify it, and rebuild it as you as you want. Um, and it was kind of the availability of these pre-built apps ready to go that meant we could get up and running really, really quickly when we first switched over to DNA Nexus. Um, so some of the apps that we use off the shelf, things like FastQC, BWA, GATK, Picard, um, and Ingenuity Variant Analysis, uh, their app for submitting the VCS into Ingenuity um, is in all our pipelines. Um, but you're not limited to the apps that are available um, already. You can build apps yourself from scratch. Um, so we've built a large number of apps ourselves. Um, some of these include things like Varscan, which we use in our somatic pipeline, uh, MultiQC, which is um, a really nice QC tool which aggregates uh, QC data from other tools such as FastQC, uh, Verify BAM ID, Picard, et cetera, and produces a really nice report. Um, we have apps for calculating coverage, um, apps for Oxford Nanopore data, all sorts that we've built ourselves. Um, so, when we're building apps, we use the DX toolkit, which is the SDK that I mentioned earlier. Um, and to build an app, you basically just have to provide all the different components that would be required to be packaged up um, by the DX build command. So this would include a wrapper script in Bash or Python, um, whatever other files or executables or scripts you want to include um, that you'd want to be downloaded onto the Linux worker that the uh, that the app will run on, you package those up. Then you have like a JSON file that will specify all of your settings, um, what inputs you have, what outputs you have, uh, what are the system requirements for this app, and that will determine um, the, the specification of the Linux worker that is spun up. And also a readme file, which will be displayed um, when someone runs the app to explain how to use it. Um, and this, I mean, it's extremely flexible, you can build anything you want. Um, it's got built in support for things like Docker, which we use in some of our apps. Um, and as well as for, for development, is that you can uh, spin up cloud workstations, um, which is really useful if you just want to try out a new tool or you're just having play around and you don't want to have to build a whole app for it. You can just spin up a cloud workstation, SSH in, and do whatever you want. Um, so. Uh, when we're, we try to follow ACGS best practice guidelines when, well, we do follow ACGS best practice guidelines when we're developing apps. Um, so that's the Association for Clinical Genetic Science uh, here in the UK. Um, they set out a lot of best practice guidelines for all sorts of things that we do uh, within our genetics labs. Um, and this involves uh, version control of software. So all of our code for um, all of our apps is version controlled in GitHub. It undergoes code review. Um, whenever we And whenever we release a new version of an app, we do a full validation on it um, before we would actually put it into production use. Um, OK, so apps are kind of the building blocks of our pipelines. But to actually uh, turn apps into pipelines, we use workflows. Um, 
So a DNA Nexus workflow is essentially a way of uh, chaining different apps together and linking the outputs of apps into as, to the inputs of other apps um, so that you get a pipeline. Um, so we have a workflow for each one of our pipelines. And like our apps, we version control our workflows. Um, so we have releases, and we, we verify that they work um, before they'd be rolled out to production. Um, so the DNX workflows are pretty good. They, are, they have nice features like uh, apps, for example, that aren't dependent on each other, can run in parallel to save time. So like in this picture here, this is our oncology workflow. Um, and you can see here that uh, once the the BAM file will come out of the amplifier blap stage. And at that point, you can it starts variant calling with both Varscan and Vardict in parallel because they're not dependent on each other. And for this pipeline, it's the BCF from Varscan that we submit to Ingenuity. So you can see that the BCF will get submitted to Ingenuity from Varscan, even though the Vardict uh, variant caller is still running. So it doesn't hold up um, the results being available for analysis. Um, OK, so another great thing about DNA Nexus is the logging it provides and the alerts as well. Um, so in a DNA Nexus project, we can see a log of everything that's happened. Um, we can see all of the jobs that were run. We can see whether they completed successfully or not. Um, if they didn't, you know, you can see things like the full command line output from the app to help you with debugging. Um, could see exactly what files went into and came out of each app, um, how long the apps took, all sorts of things. Um, and this provides essentially a complete audit trail um, for our records, which is extremely important to have when you're a clinical laboratory. Um, it makes troubleshooting easier if anything goes wrong. Um, and also, we have email alerts if any job fails. And we've actually configured it as well so that we get Slack notifications. So if anything goes wrong, we can know about it straight away and start trying to resolve that. Um, so as Rook mentioned, one of the great things about DNA Nexus is its scalability. Um, before we were using DNA Nexus, we were using a university cluster. And uh, this had a number of drawbacks. Um, we didn't have. Uh, sufficient privileges to install all the software that we wanted. We'd often have to, our jobs would sometimes have to wait in queues for a long time. Um, and it wasn't that reliable. Sometimes it would, it would, it would go down halfway through a run. Um, and DNA Nexus really solved all those problems for us. Um, there's as much compute as you need available whenever you want it. Um, and you can run huge numbers of jobs simultaneously, which is a great feature, whilst only paying for what you use, um, which is very nice. Uh, and then, it obviously, with the DX Toolkit and Upload Agent, it provides a huge array of command line tools, which has allowed us to fully automate our pipelines from end to end, um, which is which has really uh, been a bit of a game changer for us. And as I said, um, it's really easy for us to build new apps and workflows. And uh, through our setup, we can easily add new panels. Um, and it's, it's very, it makes development extremely quick and easy. Um, and another big, big uh, plus point is that DNA Nexus handles all of our data storage. So we don't have to worry about any local hardware storing data. Um, DNA Nexus provides resilient uh, cloud storage. All of our data from is easily and immediately accessible from sort of our most recent runs. And for the older stuff, we can use DNA Nexus to archive it in Amazon Glacier, which provides uh, low cost, uh, long term resilient storage, which is brilliant. And um, so that pretty much concludes what I wanted to say. So just to summarize, we built a fast and fully automated pipeline from sequencer to Ingenuity. Uh, our pipelines are ISO 15189 accredited. Um, the data security is great. We, uh, it's extremely scalable. Um, developing pipelines and apps is really simple. Um, 
data storage, got resilient data storage, and uh, very detailed logging and audit trails. Okay, so I'm just going to hand over to Matt now to tell you a bit more about the ingenuity side of things. Uh, thank you, Andy, for handover. Uh, as I uh, said previously, my name is Matt, and I'm a clinical scientist here in uh, Firepass, working on on the West team. Uh, so, uh, welcome to the Ingenuity part of this presentation. Uh, we've been using Ingenuity now for three years to analyze whole exome sequencing uh, results. And uh, during those years, there have been several updates to Ingenuity, in particular, the phenotype-driven ranking functionality. Uh, during this webinar, uh, I will describe how we use Ingenuity in an efficient manner to optimize our uh, flow through of cases, and of course, uh, how we use available features to maximize our uh, diagnostic rate. I will then present a few clinical case studies uh, as examples of uh, the presented features. Uh, our WES service is accredited uh, to ISO standards with flexible scope, uh, enabling us to create bespoke uh, panels for each case uh, without having to validate the genes and panels beforehand. For internal cases from our local clinical genetics department, we use an electronic request system in our in-house system called Mocha. Uh, in the system, uh, the clinicians log in and make the request and choose the panels and genes they want analyzed. Uh, external referrals uh, are sent to us in paper form uh, together with a sample. Uh, clinicians can choose a primary panel and a secondary panel. And the secondary panel is uh, often an expansion of the primary panel or may cover a different aspect of the patient's phenotype. Uh, the gene panels are then exported from Mocha uh, to enable easy and accurate import uh, as text files into Ingenuity. Uh, these panels often uh, range in size, but they can be quite large with the over 1,500 genes to analyze. Uh, to avail ourselves of the gene agnostic features in Ingenuity, we need a uh, uh, a thorough description of the clinical phenotype of the patient. Uh, for that, we use Phenotips, uh, which is an open source web based application for standard phenotyping using a uh, human phenotype ontology, ontology or HPO terms. Uh, this then provides us with the information we need to enable us to use the phenotype and phenotype driven ranking uh, analysis in Ingenuity. When analyzing cases in Ingenuity, we have set up standard filter setting templates. Uh, these filter settings were adjusted to our requirements from the default settings. Uh, the filter cascade in Ingenuity is linear. This requires shuffling of the filters for full analysis uh, to access the different gene panels and also the phenotype panels. Uh, sometimes, though, we can use both filters in conjunction uh, to home in on a variant of interest. Uh, the power of the dual gene panel and gene agnostic approach leads to more potential causative variants being identified. The panels and phenotype results mostly overlap but the phenotype analysis could bring to light differential diagnosis, which may not have been obvious to the clinician at the time of examination. After filtering in Ingenuity, the result is exported as VCF files. 
and import it into our in-house system where we annotate and classify the remaining candidate variants. Uh, as this is a clinical service, these exported VCF files uh, are saved together with the case-specific uh, filter settings for audit purposes. Uh, in MOCA, then, we can collect all information regarding the case in one place, and the system is designed for a seamless workflow, enabling scientists to take over from each other uh, and continue to process uh, cases rather than one scientist working on a case from start to finish. Uh, and we found this to be very beneficial to a smooth workflow and service. Uh, Ingenuity collects variant information from a number of sources, some which are presented directly and some which are linked to. Uh, the premier feature uh, is, of course, the knowledge base that enables the phenotype and phenotype-driven ranking analysis. Uh, we use the ACMG classification provided in Ingenuity with caution, uh, as not all evidence is always applicable to specific cases and some evidence can be missing. Uh, we will now move on to the clinical cases. The first case is a straightforward analysis where we identified a potentially causative variant in the primary panel. Uh, in this case, there was strictly no need for the phenotype analysis, but it was used anyways to narrow down the search. This slide shows a patient with suspected Donai Barrow syndrome or Barrager Winter syndrome, uh, where we identified a frame shift variant in the ACT B gene. Here we can see uh, that we went from 12 hits in the primary panel down to one hit when used in conjunction with the phenotype analysis. When this result was brought to the clinic for our mixed disciplinary team meeting, the referring clinician agreed that the gene was a good fit for the clinical phenotype. We sang and confirmed the variant in proband and parents, and after confirming parentage, we were able to add the PS2 criteria to the classification. Some of you might have uh, spotted the, that the classification uh, on the previous slides didn't quite add up. Uh, this case highlights the speed at which a case can be solved. Uh, unfortunately, it's not always that easy, as we can see in this case. We often come up empty despite analyzing large gene panels, plus using phenotype and ranking analysis. This slide shows a patient with several phenotypic features where nothing of interest was identified in any of the analysis. Although having all these anal analyses together in ingenuity makes it certain that you have left no stone unturned. In the third case, we found nothing uh, of interest in the primary panel would pick it up picked up uh, an interesting variant using uh, the phenotype analysis. Here we see a patient with cerebellar atrophy, and the re referring clinician choose a panel associated with ce uh, cerebellar hyperplasia. Uh, in the phenotype analysis, we then uh, identified a top 4A missense variant. The top 4A gene variant uh, turned out to be associated uh, to a similar phenotype as the one described in our case, uh, and the variant was confirmed de novo. This case highlights the difficulty of selecting the correct panel even for a highly trained clinical geneticist and the power of the phenotype analysis. In our fourth and final case, we found no variants of interest in either the panels or in the phenotype analysis. Uh, this slide shows a patient with suspected 
Pelisase Merce Backer disease, and none of the selected genes had any variants. However, as you can see in the screenshots, when performing the phenotype driven ranking, we picked up two suspect variants in the same gene. SLC17A5. It turns out that the phenotype associated to SLC17A5 fits well with our patient, and the variants were confirmed to be in trans. Uh, this case again highlights the power of the phenotype and phenotype driven ranking. Uh, and how it can assist you in finding a diagnosis uh, together with the, uh, the information in the knowledge base. In conclusion, we use Ingenuity with a combination of gene panels and phenotype analysis in our accredited West clinical service. Together with a close collaboration uh, with the clinical team uh, at Guy's Clinical Genetics Department, we have achieved what we feel is a, a high diagnostic rate. Uh, this is uh, our team Wes here at Viapass. And uh, now we'd like to open up to the live Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you, Bapaf team, for a great presentation. We now have time for Q&A. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Tap your question into the box that appears on your screen and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. OK, we can get started. Our first question is, what impact did using the Nexus and Kajen IBA have on your team's daily work? How are you, are you using the time you're sparing? Any takers for this question? Uh, for Ingenuity, uh, before Ingenuity, we used uh, Excel, uh, where we filtered and uh, applied gene panels. So uh, the move to uh, Ingenuity really helped us uh, with the, the, the workflow that they have and uh, the filters that you can adjust in real time uh, and apply more panels. And of course, the phenotype research and phenotype driven ranking that we didn't have access to previously. Uh, this was really beneficial to our workflow and the time it takes to analyze a case, uh, of course, but the extra time that we save, we use to uh, analyze more cases. Um, from a bioinformatics point of view, I'd say, um, I think just having our whole pipeline automated has just freed up a lot of time to do more development work. Um, so we're sort of currently working up new oncology pipelines, we're looking at um, new technologies such as Oxford Nanopore, and it's just freed up a lot of time um, to to develop those, really. That is great. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Andy. Uh, our next question is, which tools are you using for somatic barium calling? Um, so, for our EGFR pipeline that we've got at the moment, uh, we're using Bar scan and bar dict for variant calling. Uh, so we run both of them. And the uh, clinical scientists doing the interpretation initially look at bar scan. Um, but I think they found that uh, bar dict sometimes calls indels more reliably. So if they don't find uh, a variant they're interested in from their bar scan results, then they'll go and look at the bar dict data. Um, yeah, I should probably just add that um, that pipeline is for tumor samples only. Um, we are working on tumor normal analysis and joint somatic germline analyses as well. But um, the, the pipeline that Andy just mentioned is for tumor only. Uh, th th thanks, Luke, and thanks, Andy.
Next question. Uh, what fraction of your samples are FFP derived and do you have a dedicated QC tool? Um, so for the EGFR um, panel that we do at the moment, I think all of the samples are FFP. Um, we don't currently have any specific QC tools from the in, in the bioinformatics pipeline for the FFP samples. Um, I believe the success rate is something like 98% is what we're seeing, I think. Um, it's what I most recently heard. So um, we don't get a high failure rate or anything with the FFPs. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, so that's for the EGFR test. Um, the, uh, FFP samples that go for genome sequencing do have uh, a fairly high um, failure rate. And uh, as part of the 100,000 Genomes project, there's been quite a lot of work done to see if using fresh frozen tumor samples uh, gives you a much better um, success rate and sort of utility of um, downstream in the analysis over FFP. Uh, Thanks, Luke. Thanks, Andy. Uh, looks like we still have time for one last question. Uh, those uh, uh, whose questions we haven't had time for, please know we'll be following up with you via email. Okay, so our last question for today. How do you see the clinical genomics market growing in UK and Europe? Any takers? Um, well, so in the UK specifically, um, the genetics services in, in the NHS are going through a re-procurement process. Um, there is a desire to do some consolidation. There are over 20 genetics laboratories in, in England alone. Um, and we are hoping that uh, by introducing some sort of consolidation across those laboratories, um, it will uh, generate some, um, some savings, which we can invest into bringing on new technologies such as genome sequencing um, and, and try and make that uh, routine, um, part of routine care. So in terms of what's going to happen, um, so uh, Biopass Genetics Laboratories is expecting to see quite significant growth, um, partly because of that consolidation that's happening in the country, um, but also there is a, um, a drive to try and mainstream genetics further so that uh, specialties that haven't traditionally sent patients in for genetic testing uh, will have that available to them um, and be able to take advantage of that. So um, there are some activity projections for the next two three years for the UK, uh, and they show quite significant growth um, yeah. Uh, that's fantastic. Uh, th thanks, Book. Uh, this was the end of our Q&A. I would like to once again thank the BIPAF team, uh, left to right, Matthias Janssen, Andrew Bond, uh, Ju Vuk Anne, for the great presentation and their time. Uh, do you have any final comments? Um, no, just great. Thank you for having us. It's been a pleasure to show everyone um, how we work and, and how we've taken advantage of um, the power platforms that are out there and available for everyone. Thanks, Luke. Um, and thanks again to the whole Biopath team. If you'd like more information on how the DNA Nexus platform can be used to run clinical grade pipelines in a GXP compliant environment, or if you'd like to know more about Kaijen's ingenuity variant analysis for genomic interpretation, you may email me directly at ericcombeni at dinanexus.com. Before we go, I want to let everybody know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing for six months from today's live event. We'll receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please do share this announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. 
That's all for now. Thank you so for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.